Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Washington Brief for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Jenkins, president of the Washington Times Foundation, which sponsors this webcast. Dr. Jenkins is also chairman of the Washington Times Holdings, the LLC that owns the Times News Organization. He has led many successful fact-finding trips to Korea for policy experts and peace initiatives to the Middle East for the Universal Peace Federation. Dr. Jenkins, welcome. Thank you, Larry, and thanks for all your work with the Washington Brief. Our moderator today is Ambassador Joseph Detrani. He is a commentator on security issues. Formerly, he was a special envoy for the six party talks and did great work, I believe, to lay the foundation that has kept us free from a war in Northeast Asia. And also, he was the director of the National Counterproliferation Center and associate director of national intelligence. Dr. Alexander Manzaroff is our responder uh, to the program today. And Dr. Manzaroff is an adjunct professor of security studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He also is an adjunct professor of Korean studies at the School of Advanced and International Studies at Johns Hopkins and Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Our moderator is such an excellent uh, leader for peace. Uh, and also he will really bring the best out of our panelists today. Our, our guest panelist is Professor John Delury. John is a professor of Chinese studies at Yonsei University Graduate School of International Studies in Seoul, Korea. During the 2023-24 academic year, he is on leave to serve as inaugural Sao Fellow in Chinese Studies at the American Academy in Rome. On faculty since 2010, he serves as the Chair of International Studies at Yonsei's Underwood International College. He teaches modern Chinese history, U.S.-China relations, North Korean history and politics, and an inter introductory course on international studies. Professor Delury is the author of Agents of Subversion, The Fate of John T. Downey and the CIA's Covert War in China, and co-author of The Orville Shell of Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 20th, 21st Century. His articles can be found in Asian Survey, Journal of Asian Studies, Journal of Cold War History, and Late Imperial China. And his commentaries appear in Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The New York Times, The New York Post. And he's also been covered by The Washington Times for his time on The Washington Brief. Professor Delury is a senior fellow of the Asian Society Center of U.S.-China Relations, public intellectual fellow in the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations, board member of the Pacific Century Institute, leader council, leadership council member of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and non-resident fellow at the Sejong Institute and Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. He is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, National Committee on North Korea, Association of Asian Studies, American Historical Association and Society of Historians of uh, American Foreign Relations. He is invited to offer his analysis on Asia Pacific affairs from governments to think tanks to television and all media. We welcome you here at this time, Dr. Delury and Ambassador Dutrani, we look forward to your moderation today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for the introduction. And we're very honored to have uh, Professor Delury with us today. But look, uh, we're going to do a deep dive on North Korea, very necessary deep dive on North Korea, given North Korea's exponential increase in nuclear weapons, missile delivery systems to deliver those nuclear weapons, and, and certainly their recent, uh, relatively recent embrace of Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation and their war in Ukraine. But, but let's be mindful, and I know we all are mindful, of the, the war and suffering going on in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Myanmar, what we see in the Central African Republic, in Sudan, the gang violence in Haiti. Well, we can go on and on. But today we're focusing on North Korea, a very necessary discussion on North Korea with someone who really knows North Korea very well. 
and 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 we'll then open it up to a discussion. And that discussion will cover a lot of issues, but we'll obviously focus on North Korea and the need to peacefully resolve the nuclear issue with North Korea. So over to you, Professor Delory. Well, thanks so much, uh, Joe, and to the rest of the group for inviting me in this uh, in the Washington Brief. I'm I'm really delighted to be here uh, with people whose work I've followed and who uh, who I admire so much, and uh, and honored to be here. So I'm here for the discussion, but as instructed, I will get us started with maybe about 15 minutes of you know kind of a set piece because I did spend some time. Uh, reflecting a, a yet again fresh, given the the title of our session, uh, and and I'm also using a method here um, of a sort of future scenario brainstorming. Uh, this is something that I realized I'm being influenced by a, a workshop series run out of the uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm Institute for Peace uh, International Peace Research Institute, which uses a methodology to come up with four. Uh, future scenarios that you can apply to different developments. Um, and this idea of, you know, the future and what's the future in particular for North Korea um, was also at the, at the heart of a lecture I gave here in Rome at John Cabot University, where I posed just two scenarios, war and peace. And it was that lect lecture that sort of led to the, the recent New York Times um, op-ed uh, that I did, although it had to be kind of sanitized down for, for New York Times uh, style. So for the sake of our discussion, I want to lead off with another kind of variation on this idea of thinking about the future, uh, honing in on the wonderful subtitle you've given of diplomacy as the art of the uh, possible and think of what are possible futures, what are plausible futures from a U.S. diplomatic perspective in dealing with uh, North Korea. And I also really want to pick up on the, uh, the front part of the title, making peace with North Korea. Because in my understanding, this is really not a self-evident goal. Um, I, I don't think actually everyone agrees in Washington that the goal is to make peace with North Korea. I think maybe a more conventional title for our session, and you probably host these sessions as well, uh, would be maintaining deterrence with North Korea. Um, and this question of deterrence and peace is something I've given a lot of thought to, to the point of even looking up in, uh, in the OED, what's the etymology of this word deterrence? Where does this come from? It's from the Latin and la things Latin are on my mind because I'm here for the year in Rome. Uh, I, I can't pronounce Latin, I'm not sure anyone can anymore, but from uh, deterrentum, to frighten from. Um, and so this notion of deterrence is completely bound up with the idea of fear. It's using fear and striking fear in your enemy to prevent them from doing something. Now, obviously from the 1950s to really today, deterrence is, is also sort of bound up with uh, nuclear weapons, with in the Cold War period, the doctrine of, of mutually assured destruction, which back then, and, and some of you who are older, you lived through it, I caught the tail end. It, it was recognized there was something fundamentally almost insane, mad, irrational about it, about this notion of uh, deterrence. Obviously nothing captures that better than, than the film Dr. Strangelove. And yet the way that the Cold War played out with a lot of vigilance, with also a lot of luck, the world survived without another uh, battlefield use of nuclear weapons, although obviously there was extensive testing uh, of nuclear weapons. Now today, these associations of, with terror and with madness have sort of been lost uh, from the word deterrence, which has become the work of responsible men and women. It's been sort of bureaucratized in US foreign policy, and we see that in particular with the North Korea question. Paralleling economic sanctions, military, military deterrence is understood as sort of the peaceful alternative to war, since no shots are fired and soldiers don't meet on the battlefield. But the thing about deterrence is it, it never reaches a sort of end point. Um, there is no natural limit to it because whether when it works or holds, as we say, both sides are essentially trapped in a rivalry of deterring one another. 
that creates this inexorable tendency toward enhancement. Side A, C, side B, developing some new capability and devises countermeasures. Side B now worries and devises counter countermeasures. And this goes back and forth. There is no uh, absolute or natural or logical point at which the two sides say enough is enough. So that brings us to the situation with North Korea which at least for the last, you know, kind of five year interlude that we are still in has been defined, I would say almost entirely within the framework of deterrence. And the question I think our group is asking today is what's the future of this situation? What is it possible? And can those possibilities include diplomacy for the end of peace toward the goal of peace? So I want, I hope it's useful to lay out five scenarios. In, in Sweden, they taught me four, but I'm going to break with the Swedish model and offer five as a framework for our conversation. The first is the only thing scarier than deterrence, which is war. Uh, deterrence fails into conflict triggered by an accident or escalation, as you could say of World War I, or a strategic decision. Uh, as the beginning of World War II, both from Hitler's side as well as from Franklin Roosevelt's side in different ways. Uh, a strategic decision that we also know from our history of the Korean War taken by Kim Il-sung and uh, Joseph Stalin in, in different ways. Now, I'm obviously using that uh, term with a purpose since the recent essay by our friends Bob Carlin and Sig Hecker uh, gave a bit of shock therapy with their argument that they are convinced Kim Jong-un has made a strategic decision that diplomacy with the United States is, is, is useless, that there's no agreement to be had. And they also, I think, in their argument, imply Kim Jong-un believes his own deterrence, deterrence is insufficient, that it won't work. Also, if they are right, if Hecker and Carlin are right, clearly U.S. ROK deterrence is failing since Kim Jong-un thinks it's in his interest at some point to initiate conflict. They don't say when, where, and how, but they've put it all on our minds. Uh, and it's, it's, a, uh, it's a perfect description of the first scenario. The second scenario is deterrence in perpetuity. Constant military buildup on both sides, no meaningful diplomatic negotiation, but also no actual conflict. Now this, I mean, you guys are there in D.C. This seems to be where the majority of foreign policy thinkers and actors are, whether they're self-conscious about it or not. And indeed, this is kind of where the action is as far as policy and diplomacy. There's, the, I think we're in a moment where the U.S. government is using the failure of negotiation, but also the absence of conflict to enhance deterrence, to bolster deterrence, and particular U.S. ROK. Japan trilateral deterrence, which is not limited to North Korea, of course, but easily sold in terms of defense against the North Korean threat. The third scenario is where the two sides agree to put a ceiling on the level of deterrence. In other words, deterrence becomes arms control. Arms control, and I hesitate to lecture about arms control with Joe Dutrani staring at me in this Zoom, but uh, it's really not pure deterrence anymore, since an arms control agreement requires and also encourages some level of trust. So you have, you're complicating the mixture beyond just fear, which is the, the sole ingredient of deterrence. Now, obviously, there's a lot of arms control negotiation in, the, in particular, I guess, the second half of the Cold War, including the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. North Korea is one of the outstanding examples of, of a failure within the MPT, but that is still widely regarded as a, as a successful example. I think arms control is probably the leading alternative to the second scenario to enhance deterrence in perpetuity, at least among many North Korean experts, certainly not all. It's generally seen as plausible to expect Kim Jong-un to engage in some kind of arms control agreements. And indeed, we saw that he did that during the year of diplomacy from the Pyeongchang Olympics to the Hanoi summit, uh, in, in particular with the Comprehensive Military Agreement, the CMA negotiated with, uh, with the Republic of Korea. 
The bitter pill on the U.S. side is arms control implies forsaking denuclearization anytime soon, maybe ever, whether you want to say that out loud or not. The consolation to that is almost no one, no one I know, anticipates denuclearization happening anytime soon anyway, if ever. And so uh, you at least make some progress. The fourth scenario, I, I'm not hearing as much. Uh, it's always lurking out there, but the last spike that I'm aware of was a while ago, a decade ago, between sort of 2009 and 2012, in the transition from a sickly Kim Jong-il to a very young Kim Jong-un. And we saw it again back in the late 1990s when North Korea was really at a nadir. That scenario is where one side loses, it folds. Uh, the classic example would be a political event like the fall of the USSR. So here deterrence fails into victory for one side and collapse for the other. Ironically, the DPRK had this fantasy about South Korea for many decades. For a while, particularly the post-Cold War moment, we had this fantasy about the DPRK. Seems like now with the resilience of communist China and also the maturation of Kim Jong-un, you hear less of it. Even though at least I hear less of it, I do think it's an important scenario to keep in mind because I think it lingers behind the theory of deterrence in perpetuity. The idea being that if we can just hold the line and keep making Kim Jong-un spend more on weapons than his country can afford, eventually the DPRK will break. Okay, so only fifth and last do I come to the scenario of our title, Making Peace. And that's deliberate because the way I see it, it reflects how marginal in the mainstream foreign policy debate, which is dominated by the logic of deterrence, which is occasionally unnerved by the risk of war, which is challenged a bit by the pragmatic arguments of arms control, which is haunted by the hope of North Korean collapse. Finally, we get to the idea of making peace. I tried in my recent piece for the New York Times to make as pragmatic a case as I could and compelling a case for precisely that, for making peace. I argued it would require direct involvement of Joe Biden. In fact, in the original lecture that I gave here in Rome, I did a bit of an impersonation of Joe Biden in the Rose Garden as he appointed John Kerry to the point where some of the students were confused that that had actually happened. Um, I would have Joe Biden use the language of peace and friendship on the model of say US Vietnam normalization and also echoing the language used in the Singapore agreement between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un of establishing new relations. I explained in the piece why I do think Kim Jong-un would reciprocate, at least in the initial phase of engaging in talks, which has not occurred so far with the Biden administration. And the two reasons I argue for are, simply put, China and the economy. I think China will be a focus of our discussion, so hopefully we'll get more into that later. But let me just give away my central working hypothesis about DPRK-PRC relations in the Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un era, which is that on a good day, they're frenemies. These guys do not like one another. They don't click with one another. They are wary of one another and worried about one another. So they're also careful. In this, Kim Jong-un is not so different from his father or grandfather, and Xi Jinping is not so different from his political parents and grandparents, Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong. The distrust and dislike that pervades China-North Korea relations is a condition of possibility of peace and normalization and real improvement of relations between North Korea and the United States. But this would require a pretty profound gestalt shift for US foreign policy thinking, which conceives of Beijing playing the role of helping it to coerce North Korea into denuclearization. 
which tends to end up as a lot of frustration that China's not helping and tends to waste a lot of time and capital in US-China relations. All right, so hopefully we can come back to that. The second motivation, and I'm almost done here, for Kim Jong-un is economic. As I've argued from his early days, I still believe Kim Jong-un has ambitions to drag the DPRK out of economic backwardness. If the Biden administration showed up with serious willingness to let the DPRK prosper, I'm convinced Kim Jong-un would be interested and start movement in a direction we haven't really seen, unleashing dynamics we also haven't seen, because he would be opposed internally uh, if that process were unleashed. So there's a lot of flaws in this, in this modest proposal for peace. And just to name one of them right at the outset is the question of what's in it for the United States. And as a sub question, what's in it for Joe Biden? And in the responses I got back from my uh, op-ed, I heard a lot of that. In terms of the negotiation, I, I kind of punt a little bit here. I think the United States government hasn't really thought through what it wants from a negotiation, a peace negotiation with a nuclear North Korea. Because two decades of thinking has been really predicated on wanting denuclearization. So I think we still have a bit of a black hole. I tried to chip away a bit at that black hole by talking about something, a new factor like negotiating so that North Korea would curb or stop its sales, its uh, military exchange with Russia. Uh, in other pieces, I've talked about the potential for intelligence sharing on China. And of course, you have a sort of a default benefit of a potentially drastically lowered proliferation risk. But I admit there's some murkiness there. And again, this is good fodder for our discussion. Now, finally, for Joe Biden, we we'll leave that to the politicians. Um, but I would say that his hesitancy has to be measured against, first, the risk of something really happening when he's doing nothing. Second, this gets into our views of, of American politics. At the end of the day, do American voters really care? Short of war, do they really care about what happens on the Korean Peninsula? In, in my experience, probably not. So I, I'm not sure that the political risk is really so, so high for Joe Biden. I think if he thinks it's the right thing to do diplomatically and geopolitically, he should do it. Okay, I've set the table. Hopefully now we can start the real feast. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, John, that was a, outstanding, truly outstanding. Uh, I'm going to look to Alexander to start the, the uh, discussion. But let me just say one or two things. Uh, China, and you mentioned China. Uh, China in the six-party talks was very, uh, very active. They took a very uh, proactive approach because China doesn't want North Korea, a North Korea with nuclear weapons. They don't want instability. It's not in their interest in, in, to have that happen in the, in the region. So therefore, China in the six party talks was very, very proactive. And, and the, the possibility down the road, maybe of getting them involved again and uh, would, would obviously is on the table. And, and so that's, that's something that we, we will further, further discuss. And we did have some progress in the six party talks. And you mentioned the economic incentives. Uh, that was a big part of the six party discussions. So, but let's open it up with Alexander and then we'll get into an open discussion. Alexander, over to you, please. Hey, uh, thank you, Ambassador and John. An outstanding presentation. I second Ambassador's assessment here. Uh, again, very illuminating, uh, very well-organized, uh, thought-provoking. Uh, so uh, really enjoyed uh, listening to your, uh, to your statement, opening statement. Uh, now, uh, I, uh, I will be brief. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you said that uh, in your five scenarios uh, of the future, uh, peace or making peace uh, with the end state of peace being made accomplished is really a marginal uh, kind of scenario the, the way uh, you put it and uh, to my regret I, I can't agree more with you I mean we're on the same page here uh, now peace is a, it's like a, 
the puzzle, you know, making peace with a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and you highlighted some of them. Uh, and I, again, I, I hope we'll have time to uh, discuss some of the pieces which you uh, mentioned. Um, I'll uh, just bring your attention uh, to a few other pieces uh, which you didn't mention, not because you don't care or you're not aware. Uh, I'm just trying to compliment you here uh, and to, to kind of uh, enlarge the picture a little bit. Uh, and specifically, uh, it takes two and sometimes uh, more than two to tango, if you wish. Uh, and in the uh, case of peacemaking in North, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, it takes a bunch of parties, uh, you know, to learn how to tango. Uh, and one party, uh, the critically important party, uh, that is North Korea, these days uh, seem to be uh, looking the other way. If you wish, uh, uh, I am talking about the pivot to the north. Uh, how I call it, rebalancing to the north, uh, away from uh, uh, the south, as pursued by Kim Jong-un, is exemplified at least by two major shifts. Uh, one is the abandonment of the unification line, unification strategy. Uh, not that calling South Korea an enemy state is something unprecedented. No, that's not uh, unprecedented. Uh, but... Uh, uh, really, uh, the abandonment of 80-year-old uh, uh, unification policy uh, and an open and clear and loud pronouncement that uh, uh, North Korea now regards itself, identifies itself uh, as a different uh, state, a normal state, which uh, wants to have nothing to do uh, with what used to be a brotherly state uh, uh, in the South across the DMZ. This is something new, you know, which, and, you know, they're willing to go as far as to uh, amend the constitution. You know, they changed the anthem, uh, uh, edited the maps, you know, destroyed all the monuments re related to unification, scrapped the unification laws. Uh, related to unification, ab abolished uh, uh, all the organizations, uh, government and civil, involved in uh, uh, inter-Korean relations, unification uh, uh, matters and all that. Uh, so that's one aspect of that pivot to the north. And of course, the other aspect is that uh, renewed uh, relationship uh, with the Russian Federation uh, from the top down, uh, not only, uh, you know, the summit meeting uh, which took place last year between Putin and Kim, but the uh, anticipated uh, summit in Pyongyang after Putin's uh, inauguration, uh, foreign ministers talks, both in Pyongyang and Moscow, defense ministers talks, uh, in Pyongyang and Moscow. And just a few days ago, the visit by the head of the uh, Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, Narishkin, Sergei Narishkin, to Pyongyang, and new agreements made uh, during that, uh, uh, I wouldn't say unprecedented. I mean, his predecessor, uh, Mikhail Fratkov, did visit Pyongyang back in 2011. But again, in the past, uh, uh, it was uh, 13 years ago, and now uh, clearly a new chapter in that intelligence sharing, as you indicated, uh, between two Koreas. And uh, again, the gift which he brought there, uh, we still don't know what exactly it was, uh, the Narishkin's gift, uh, I mean, Putin's gift to Kim uh, is presented by Narishkin, but uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, glimpses of that we already saw in New York when uh, the Russian Federation vetoed uh, a resolution extending the mandate of the sanctions uh, committee. Uh, if there is no more negotiation on that, although the door is still open, uh, before the end of April, that will be the end of uh, uh, the UN monitoring of the sanctions uh, regime imposed on that country. Uh, so that pivot to the north is a, obviously a major reality, new reality uh, with which uh, we have to deal. Uh, and so uh, before we move on to uh, the China issue or US issue, I'd like to uh, kind of hear your thoughts on the significance 
of that pivot to the North, rebalancing of North Korean foreign policy. Uh, it's a new North politic, if you wish, as exemplified by the abandonment of the unification line and new relationship with Russia, strategic relationship with Russia. So if you could assess uh, that significance, uh, its significance for us, and what it means for the cause of peace. I mean, does it delay peace or uh, does it rewrite the rules of the road for how we will get to that peace uh, or uh, will it uh, cement uh, the prospects for peace? I mean, wh what's your take on that? Should I jump in right here on that, oh, Ambassador? Please, John, please. Okay, yeah, thanks so much to both of you for those uh, uh, comments. And let, let me start though, um, uh, Alexander, with this, uh, I had in my notes, KJ used Nordpolitik, and then you beat me to it, naming your own uh, <laughs> superb description of, that's that's a really um, succinct articulation of a key trend in terms of what Kim Jong-un is doing. And I'll try to divide up, you know, to the question, what does that mean uh, for the prospects for peace? Let me start with the Russia aspect of it. Um, I'm still... Uh, I guess skeptical in terms of, I don't know how far it can go. I don't, I'm not sure any of us do. You you have uh, better empirical knowledge, but um, I remain a little skeptical of sort of how far that can develop in terms of the material benefits, the strategic benefits that Kim Jong-un and North Korea can receive from Russia, given its its own, you know, kind of weakened position in the international order that almost makes it kind of desperate enough to consider North Korea important. Right. That's one of the um, the strange sort of plot twists, because at some level, Putin is sort of desperate for um, people he can meet on the world stage. Um, so I, I, I do still believe there's kind of a limit to how much uh, Kim Jong-un can get out of that. I, I also think it does relate to China. I think that there's kind of a game within the game going on in terms of the, the very complicated triangle, if we can even describe it as a triangle between China, Russia, and North Korea. And my sense of uh, the Chinese position, unspoken position is they don't like what they're seeing in terms of this uh, closeness between, you know, this kind of North politic is moving away, of course, from the United States, but it's also kind of a Northern move away from the West, away from a closer relationship with China. So I think that there's a tension there. So this is all to say that um, I don't I don't see, I guess I still see it as a kind of temporary tactical move that makes a lot of sense both for Putin and Kim Jong-un. I'm not sure it's a sustainable kind of strategic direction that Kim Jong-un can continue to, to move in. And the other thing I would add is, as I said at the outset, as I uh, mentioned in, in my uh, op-ed, you know, one of the things as we try to imagine, okay, if North Korea goes into negotiations with, uh, the United States goes into North Korea, uh, negotiations with North Korea, and it's really not about CBID. It is, you know, that's kind of there, but the agreement is like, let's not harp on that because we know we can't make any progress. Where can we make progress? You know, what can I give you and what can you give me? Um, in that context, I do think strangely, paradoxically, this, Fairly recent, you know, real uptick in North Korea-Russia relations actually gives something for them to talk about, about the Americans saying, hey, look, is there a way we can fill the gap of what you're getting from the Russians? You know, and here's where you start to put things like uh, relief on sanctions enforcement, but not in terms of letting the Chinese and the Russians trade with the North Koreans, but instead opening them up in the other direction. Uh, to, to sort of compensate essentially for the loss that North Korea would suffer from curtailing that developing relationship with Russia. So I think there is an element there that could be used toward peace. To me, it's still not kind of... Um, now, South Korea is a lot more difficult, as we all know, and complicated because of the politics uh, of the South and because, you know, South Korea is obviously divided at, in, a, in a fundamental way between two or probably three different positions as far as the kind of relationship that they want with North Korea. We're most aware because it's it's overrepresented politically by, we could just call it the, the default liberal position, the default conservative position um, of, you know, conservatives more or less taking a hardline approach. So far, the UN administration has, uh, apart from some rhetoric early on, 
you know, played the part of a fairly traditional conservative, you know, kind of tough, hardline uh, stance. And insofar as that represents their core and there's nothing else there within the administration, that's hugely problematic for making peace uh, so long as that administration is in power. Um, you just kind of have to, to accept that. Um, now, the default liberal position, of course, is more open to engagement. And we saw with Moon Jae-in embracing peacemaking. Then again, and I was there and watching all that stuff really up close and respected the philosophy and, and thought it was the right way to go. And yet I really saw the limits of the South Korean liberal approach um, in a way that I think maybe Kim Jong-un also saw its limits and was disappointed. Because when push came to shove, the Moon administration would not move ahead of the Trump administration. And so when things started to really flatten out between Trump and Kim, everything was basically dead in the, in the water and there was no movement in inter-Korean relations. A conservative government paradoxically could be bolder if they really thought, as we know some conservative, South Korean conservatives have in the past, uh, I mean, the original Nord Politik, if they thought there was really something to pursue, uh, a conservative am administration could conceivably be more effective in moving things forward. Uh, just like I think Joe Biden could be more effective as a Democrat, which is essentially the more hardline party toward North Korea in the United States. So while the way things stand now, Seoul you know, is essentially an obstacle to peace movement, I do think that there's potential for uh, you know, kind of a reshuffling of dynamics in a way that uh, if Joe Biden took the lead, you know, I could see uh, President Yoon kind of moving along with it and theoretically potentially uh, being more effective. So um, yeah, it, you, 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 I can't deny that um, it's problematic in terms of, again, will Kim Jong-un play ball? That's, that's also at the heart of your question, given the things he said the thing, the legislation that he's calling uh, in terms of changes in inner Korean policy. Again, there's a way in which either with the current administration or a future administration, Kim Jong-un could be laying foundations for a totally different relationship. I mean, essentially a two-state solution. You hate to use that term, but for the Korean Peninsula, where DPRK actually moves first and says, look, we recognize we're doing our thing and you're doing your thing. Let's redraw the map. Let's be responsible about this. Potentially down the road, a uh, ROK administration, including this one, could say, okay, great. Because the last point here is, I said there are three views or three positions in the South. The liberal and the conservative are the ones that we always see and are represented in the, in the Blue House uh, presidency and in the National Assembly. But there's also a huge, uh, probably majority of South Korean people, certainly younger people who are the ones as a professor I've dealt with in my 13 years there predominantly, and they have a totally different set. You, you can't describe them as conservative or liberal. They have a fundamentally different identity, different conception, different prioritization. So they look at the question of unification differently. Uh, and they are weirdly, more in tune with what Kim Jong-un was saying recently, as far as, look, there's Republic of Korea and you're doing your thing and there's the DPRK and we're doing our thing. That's how a lot of young South Koreans feel. Now, their parents don't feel that and their grandparents don't feel that. But there is that third, less represented position. And that can potentially be a constituency toward a, a kind of peacemaking um, where the two Koreas move into a really different relationship with one another. Of the, and, and that's when Kim Jong-un saying, I want to end the 80-year approach, actually starts to make sense. I mean, within a South Korean context, it makes a certain amount of sense. So th thank you, John, and thank you, Alexander, for the question. John uh, and Alexander, I I'm going to uh, posit a few things here and then ask you uh, one or two questions, John. Let me uh, start by saying this, uh, having dealt with North Korea for a number of years, the one thing that Kim Jong-un, like his father Kim Jong-il and his grandfather Kim Il-sung, wants, or at least wanted, and I still believe they want, 
and Kim Jong-un wants it, is a normal relationship with the United States. And I think we have to keep that in mind. And I think, you know, both of you historians are looking at that relationship between China and, and, and the Korean Peninsula and, and Korea, where China has viewed them as a vassal state, et cetera. I think, I think North Korea in this instance certainly wants a good relationship with the United States. And we saw this through negotiations with North Korea. And, and we saw this with the six party talks and we saw it with the joint statement of 19 September 2005 with, with security assurances and a path to normal relations uh, and economic, if you will, incentives where foreign direct investment came into the country. This was appealing to Kim Jong-il and indeed to Kim, Kim Jong-un. So that, that's a centerpiece, a normal relationship with the United States. However, it's on their terms as a nuclear weapon state, as you've accepted Pakistan, accept us as a nuclear weapon state. And the United States, for very uh, obvious reasons, and I think correct reasons, has said, no, we want a normal relationship with you. We want to have that relationship. And we think that would be beneficial for the 23, 24 million people living in, in North Korea, where you get the foreign direct investment and you come into the uh, family of, of, of nation states and you're no longer a pariah state. I think that's that's appealing. But as a nuclear weapon state, no. The proliferation issue, the uh, nuclear arms race in the region, certainly we saw this in South Korea. You you were there, John, with, when the over 70% of the people said, let's get our own nuclear weapons. And that's not where we want to go. Japan down the road. And, and, and we saw it with Syria and, and North Korea starting in 1997. In 1997, when we were building two light water reactors at Kumho, providing a heavy fuel oil, giving them a significant food aid at that time when they were suffering, when they had food scarcity. But they were giving, if you will, the Syrian regime a capability of building nuclear weapons by building a nuclear reactor in, in al Qabar in Syria. So the proliferation issue, and that's why we told the North Koreans, We'll normalize with you. We'll move in that direction, but not as a nuclear weapons state. We won't accept that. And so we saw this unravel in Hanoi. And you mentioned the Singapore agreement. And that was very positive. I agree with you. There was no question in my mind about that. A transformation of a relationship with, the, with, with North Korea. A, 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 a movement towards a normal relationship. But also based on complete verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And there are no nuclear weapons in South Korea, as we all know. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important piece of it. So what is the default? North Korea says, no, well, it's not working that way. We, did, we, we, we still want our nuclear weapons. And the US is saying, no, we'll, we'll move with you, and, 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 but, but not as a nuclear weapons state. So what we've seen over the years, with, certainly with Kim Jong-un, and this is important, the exponential increase of nuclear weapons and, and missiles to deliver those nuclear weapons. My goodness. And, the, and as you and Alexander are talking, the embrace of Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation, where, where North Korea now is providing a weaponry, artillery shells, missiles to to the Russian Federation for the, the, the war in Ukraine. And then this is not where we want to go. So I have to wonder when we say and have said we want to contain, we will have a policy of containing North Korea and and what? And you used the term before, and that's a and deterring North Korea. Well, we haven't deterred North Korea from building more nuclear weapons. We haven't deterred North Korea from building more missiles to deliver those weapons or to get in the area of chemical and biological warfare or movement towards cyber and what they're doing on cyber. So we've not deterred them on those issues. If we're talking about deterring them on, on war, well, you mentioned a few minutes ago, John, what they did in 2010, we go back to 2010, where they took down the, uh, the, uh, the Corvette and the Chungan and killed 46 sailors. So they could do something like that again not war per se, but something that could escalate into war. And that's our concern. And that's why all people, to include the, the, the Americans, 
have to be concerned about war in, in, on the Korean Peninsula and what it would mean for the region. And that's, that's, that's important. So deterrence, we haven't deterred North Korea from building more nuclear weapons and, 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 and delivery systems to deliver those weapons and, and committing other, other moves, other illicit activities, cyber, et cetera. Containment, have we contained North Korea? Well, look at the relationship with, with, with the Russian Federation as you and Alexander are talking about this. Embracing Vladimir, Vladimir Putin and movement towards that area there, and, and also with China, but but not a, not to that extent, because I think recently I think Xi Jinping made it very clear China is not supportive of even the threat or indeed the use of nuclear weapons. This is Xi Jinping, despite the fact that Putin is putting nuclear weapons on the table. So there is that element there. So so I I, I do think. That, that there's a lot there that we have to look at our policy. It hasn't been working. I think that's the thrust of, of your article, your, your excellent op-ed in the New York Times. It hasn't been working. So let's, let's move, let's, let's do something, let's be creative. And you use those, term in, those terms in your, in your op-ed. Let's, let's look at that. And we have said something recently. And this administration, the Biden administration most recently has put on the table we can keep denuclearization way down the road. It's not the Libyan model, where North Korea has to denuclearize initially, and then we'll move with lifting sanctions, sanctions relief, lifting sanctions, economic development assistance. That could be way down the road. Let's look at intermediate steps, as we did in the six party talks, actions for actions, commitments for commitments. And that's the approach. So the Biden administration, I think in the last month, has put this on the table and said we could move in a gradual way. We keep denuclearization way down. It could be years. It could be a decade or more. But that's down the road. But let's intermediate steps. And, and during those intermediate steps, we could even move towards, if you will, normalization, intersections, liaison offices in our respective capitals. So there's something there. There's room there for progress. And that's my question to you, John. Hmm. How do you see that? Do you see this recent Biden administration proposal coming out of our National Security Council, where we're saying this could be a gradual, even even uh, uh, Jung, Jung Park put this on, our, our senior officer responsible for North Korea, put this on the table. Do you see this as a viable approach? And, and, and second, do you see Kim Jong-un sort of saying, Let's think twice about this. If there's an opportunity of dealing and moving towards a normal relationship with the United States, isn't this a better prospect than, than if you will, being tethered to the Russian Federation? Well, thanks, Joe. I mean, you you lay it out so um, clearly and, and eloquently. Um, and to get us to focus on, first of all, the failure of deterrence, uh, the failure of containment and and seems like we're on the same wavelength in terms of there needs to be uh, a real hard look at a policy that's not working, you know, um, and you can't just keep doing the same thing. Now, as far as it's very interesting, when I we all try to put on our Kim Jong-un hats or I, I usually try to put on the hat of someone in the room advising Kim Jong-un. And what can I say? What sounds convincing, you know, within that context? And this question of does he, is he interested in a normal relationship? Um, and, and I think Bob and Sig, to some extent, we're dancing around the idea of like, he's, he's, he's not interested anymore. It's over. You know, that, that ship sailed basically with the failure of the Hanoi summit. Um, that's probably not a fair characterization, but let's pretend that's correct. I am not of that. I'm not persuaded yet that it's really over, you know, um, and, and that because, again, of really developing his economy and really balancing against China, I don't think to, to Alexander's point earlier, I don't think Nord politics solves that problem for him in a, in a long, sustained way. Um, that is what the United States can offer. Normalization of the relationship with the United States can can open up a whole set of uh, economic opportunities and geopolitical 
uh, advantages um, that that Putin can offer and that I think do appeal. They continue to appeal to Kim Jong-un. The big problem is, and this is where the recent stuff and the older stuff is so problematic, and Americans have a hard time seeing themselves this way, but from a North Korean perception, we are so untrustworthy. We are so difficult to sort of, you know, count on. Just like it's, it, there's a lot of mirroring. Essentially, the way we see the North Koreans, they see us. And I think you dealt with a lot of this in the Six Party Talks framework of having to work through all that um, suspicion about what will happen. And what about when you elect a new a new president and or a new party wins Congress? And then what? And all this is toast. And this was the Trump problem. He had the right idea, at least on this one thing. He had the right idea. Leader to leader was a good idea. It was smart to set up the summit. And, and we saw on the ground a test moratorium that was great for that period of time. We weren't waking up to a new test of a new capability. So there's, there's verifiable evidence that that created a positive turn in things moving in from a very bad direction to a, a somewhat better direction. But then he couldn't carry it through. You know, he couldn't deliver uh, because of the particular characteristics of him as, as a leader. And so I think this is the problem. Really what it comes down to, Joe, is like, let's say, or I agree with you, Kim Jong-un still is interested. He still wants a normal relationship with the United States. And I think, you know, in my short trips to North Korea, I sensed as an American there in an unofficial capacity, there's some broader interest it would be meaningful, you know, to North Koreans. Wow, it happened. We're no longer enemies with America. America treats us as an equal. The problem is, does America want a normal relationship with North Korea? Even, an, even a non-nuclear North Korea, which is not what we're even talking about. I mean, diplomatically, we're talking, as you described, in a smart way of, okay, let's just Make it clear it's not Libya. We're putting it down the road and let's build up other things. But we are going to have to, the United States is going to have to really show now in our signaling and immediately if these talks were to open up, we are going to have to work very hard to, to prove to the North Koreans, no, we're really serious. The Biden administration, U.S. Congress, the U.S. public is really sick of this ancient enmity with your country. We're over it and we get it. We don't want to go on coexisting like that. And I don't think we're very, you know, do you hear senators talking that way? Um, is that a, me do you think that that represents the way the US media speaks about or thinks about North Korea? So I think there's a, a big problem. If we are able, if we're going to be able to make progress toward peace and normalization, there's, there's a big burden on the American side to really prove to the North Koreans uh, that we're serious. And, and so that's, that's to me the big stumbling block. I think these, um, you know, these kind of signals at the NSC level are positive. Um, I'm guessing that the, the thinking is probably more along the lines of, well, look, it'd be crazy to do, you know, if anyone read my op-ed, for example, well, that's an interesting idea, but we're certainly not going to do that in an election year. But maybe we can tee things up for after the election. And, you know, I could see Kim Jong-un understanding that as well. But in my view, it's going to take more than, you know, tweaking some of the phraseology to really restart the process. It's very possible there will be no talks between the Biden administration and, and the Kim Jong-un administration. And that'll be, you correct me, you lived it, but that's gonna be the first, the first time in uh, post-Cold War history where there's nothing at the government to government level. You know, so we're gonna be kind of moving into uncharted territories in, in terms of that is gonna be Kim Jong-un saying, look, until you guys are ready, I don't need to talk to you and I'm not interested and I got a lot of other things going on. So that's what we're up against. Thank you, John. No, no, I think you, you made some excellent points on that. I would like to, to believe that uh, Kim Jong-un would, would see an opportunity here. Uh, and, and I think when we talk about sanctions and sanctions relief, 
and even the possibility of lifting sanctions uh, in an action for action basis. I think that has to be somewhat appealing, but let's further discuss that. Over to you, Alexander, please. Hey, th thank you, Ambassador. And John, again, uh, an outstanding answer uh, to a great question. Uh, really enjoyed your insights, uh, which made me think that uh, I should talk to you more as a mirror, yeah, yeah, you know, because you're very self-reflective and uh, uh, it will keep us all honest here, yeah, you know, uh, throwing the ball really back to where it belongs. Uh, in my opinion. Now, a quick question. We have to wrap it up here. Uh, but if I had, a, if you had a crystal ball, uh, I know you talked a lot about the Biden administration, but we are seven months out and my crystal ball tells me, and maybe it's skewed, but my crystal ball tells me that we'll have a different administration uh, in the next four years. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, my question to you is very simple, uh, and if you could give us a very brief answer, uh, you know, uh, let's speculate that uh, if we have a change in the White House and President Trump is reelected uh, for his sec for the second term, I mean, uh, what would you expect the impact to be on the North Korea-U.S. relationship? I mean, you said this is the first four years since the end of the Cold War when there was no dialogue, nothing. Uh, and that uh, at the end of a very robust summit diplomacy, uh, which almost brought us across the finish line. Uh, so what's your expectation? If you look at the crystal ball, if let's say uh, President Trump is in the White House uh, next uh, January, I mean, what would you expect? Would it make chances for peace better uh, or not. I mean, uh, can we hope at least that uh, peace will become uh, finally possible, if not attainable, in the next four years under Trump? Thanks, Alexander. Um, I think not. Uh, I would rather see a second Biden term for all of the stuckness in the Democratic, you know, kind of party. Uh, mentality toward North Korea, uh, which I experienced even before Trump, I found Republicans more open-minded about uh, maybe trying something new in North Korea. There's a, there's a real, within the kind of liberal democratic foreign policy mindset, there, there's a certain closed-mindedness. Uh, I'm painting the brush pretty, pretty broadly. Um, but it's precisely for that reason that I think we need a democratic president to break through that, if, if that makes sense. And then if we're talking about a second Donald Trump term, I mean, I expect, honestly, more theatricality. I think the chances of a summit are higher. Uh, I, I think after, though, you know, I would expect, uh, what is it, uh, you know, Marx, uh, Marx's revision of Hegel, you know, first time tragedy, second time farce. There was something real there. Uh, in, in Singapore, and then it kind of fell apart. In a second Trump, I would expect them to meet, maybe Trump goes to North Korea, but kind of pure theater. And the North Koreans know too, and they do it for theatricality on their side, and Trump does it because it's clickbait, but there's no real possibility for something deeper happening. Um, so uh, my vote for peace would be the chances are higher uh, although there are very big obstacles there, but still higher, the potential is higher in a second Biden administration. Thank John, I, I know we're, we're closing. Thank you for your question, Alexander, and John, for your answer. You know, I, I opened this discussion by talking about some of the, uh, the wars, the wars that are going on and the suffering. Um, I mentioned Ukraine and certainly Gaza about what's happening in Myanmar and Sudan and the Central African Republic. We can go down a list. Food scarcity, climate change, pandemic issues, and, and there's so much going on in the world. And now the element of proliferation where nuclear weapons are in play. I mean, nuclear weapons are in play and the destruction that would be. I mean, we I think we all saw this, or many of us saw the movie Oppenheimer or read the book, Prometheus. Uh, these are weapons of mass destruction, and they're in play. So when we talk about the Korean Peninsula and we talk about a North Korea with nuclear, significant nuclear weapons, and as your op-ed indicated, 
uh, nuclear weapons that can now reach the United States, in theory, reach the United States. I mean, this is something that has to be, and the ability of miscalculation of, 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 of miscommunications. Uh, so all these issues, and, and, and my personal view is we're not giving enough attention to what's happening on the Korean Peninsula and the exponential uh, increase in nuclear weapons with North Korean delivery systems and, and efforts to be creative and working towards resolving that issue. And, and, and I, I applaud the Biden administration's recent approach to coming up with some sort of a, a formula, a path to moving forward. And, and hopefully elections will not get in the way of this. And, 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 and Kim Jong-un would see an opportunity here because embracing the Russian Federation and the war in Ukraine and, and supporting and moving in that direction, that's not gonna be, it's not gonna be in the interest of the, of the North Korean people in my, in my view. So uh, I'll end on this note. I think we all have to have hope. And I think your op-ed indicated that element of hope there, where we have to be creative and, 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 and bold in our approach and, and not accept the fact that uh, we will be uh, in a forever war or forever conflict with the uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And hopefully that will be there. So I want to thank you, John. And I want to thank Alexander. This has been a, just an outstanding discussion. And I want to thank the, uh, the uh, UPF and the Washington Times Foundation, Michael, for uh, permitting us to have these discussions so that we could illuminate these, these issues for the, uh, for the broader public and we could all get involved in this discussion. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. Ambassador Detrani, thank you for moderating this excellent program. Dr. Deluri, uh, very good insights. We look forward to having you back again. We would like to continue to engage in discussion with you and other uh, forums also. And Dr. Manzaroff, always, you uh, really bring out incredible insights. Uh, I wanna thank the Washington Times itself because it does cover this program. Uh, Chris Dolan's our president and also uh, Mr. Guy Taylor's the uh, the team leader for the national security team. And uh, they have started a new uh, publication. It's uh, online. It's part of the Washington Times. It's called Threat, Us, Threat Status. And uh, go to WashingtonTimes.com. You can find it there and just sign up for it. And it's a daily newsletter that gives you a very quick and updates, uh, quick updates on insights of what just happened this morning or yesterday or or even what they see happening in the afternoon. It's very, very exciting to read. Um, we wanna thank everybody again for the Washington Brief. Uh, we look forward to dialogue. We, we will never give up on dialogue with North Korea. And we do believe America is in the key role and we would like to see uh, that door open again. I don't think there's any better person that could bring it, bring that up as Ambassador Detrani and also the uh, participants here, Dr. Deluri and also Dr. Mantra. We all believe in dialogue. We don't think that a lack of communication leads to more problems um, and more misunderstandings. So we look forward to next month's program. It's the first Tuesday of every month and we thank you all. Have a wonderful week.